Good day. Good to have you with us uh, for our ABC, the adult Bible class. Uh, just so uh, that you know, we were not able to uh, video last week, uh, but the last, the first three um, studies um, for January are now up on, uh, on the link uh, with uh, holycrossbcs.org. So we're going to pick up where that ended. Uh, we're in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, we're dealing with or talking about Paul and Silas in Philippi. But let's make our beginning first in the name of our God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And as always, we ask that the Spirit work within us so that we don't just see this as history uh, back there long ago and far away, but see how these words and these actions apply to us in the church today. Move us to hear it, receive it into our hearts, and then put it into action, both in faith and trust in you and in our life of service. And to that end, we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, picking up in chapter 16, uh, Paul and Silas, not Barnabas anymore, Barnabas and, and Paul have uh, gone separate ways to do the ministry. Uh, Paul has picked up Silas, um, a man of Antioch, and they are traveling. Now, in this chapter, they're going to pick up two people. Uh, having gone um, to Derby and Lister, and Lister, there they pick up Timothy, who uh, Paul later on will call my son in the faith, uh, who had become a Christian, uh, was a Jew, and now Paul wants to take him with. And then when we get down to, um, in the 16th chapter, to verse 10, we just read that. And when Paul had se seen the vision, that was the vision that he could not go into Asia or my Asia, uh, but had to go to Europe, to Macedonia, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. In that verse, the pronouns change. They're no longer they and he, it's us and we, which leads us to believe that Luke has also joined them. So now they're a party of four, and we're going to hear that uh, because they, Paul leaves some behind to do some more work and then wants them to catch up with him. They move and head over um, to Europe. And the first place they go uh, is to Philippi. And that's where we are in this story. Um, Lydia has been converted along with some other women. Uh, there was no synagogue. There weren't enough Jewish men, I guess, to form the 10 that was necessary. But she has um, come to faith and has demonstrated and proved that faith. And her home is the, the headquarters, the jumping off place for um, the missionaries. But as usual, um, Paul gets himself into some trouble. And that's where we pick up at verse 16. Uh, we'll read it all the way through to 24. And as they were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. And Paul, having been greatly distressed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, <clears throat> pardon me, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews. A little anti-Semitic there. And they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not law for us, lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. And the crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. Now, this is Paul and Silas. 
And when they inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. At the very end, the careful keeping uh, or um, taking charge uh, put their legs into stocks, which was a little more than keeping them secure. It also um, was torture to a degree. And he put them in the inner room so that there would be no escaping. But verse 16 talks about they went out to the place of prayer. And maybe you remember that, that Philippi was a Roman colony. And the emperor had a decade or a few years before had made all the Jews leave Rome. And the Roman colonies were a designation to be a little Rome. There were Roman citizens there. And so it's not hard to imagine that in Philippi 2, they drove out the Jewish men uh, or the Jewish families, but not all of them. Um, we don't know who was gathering at the river uh, to pray and to worship uh, when Paul and Silas found them. But they did. Anyhow, while they're going out there or traveling around, this young slave girl, slave girl who had a spirit, a demon of divination, an evil spirit within her, and she was able to do fortune telling, uh, or so people supposed, I imagine. I don't know that demons have uh, prenitions and know what's going ahead, but it certainly seemed that way. And she keeps yelling out, follow Paul and crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Now, last week, Pastor um, Hayford preached on this, or I guess the week before now already, uh, about the demons. Uh, that they knew Jesus, which when you stop and think about it is not hard to understand because they had known him from the time they were created in heaven. Uh, and Jesus knew them before uh, Satan led a third of them in rebellion against God and were cast down to the earth and into the, the prison where they're kept. Uh, I think it's first or second Peter, I don't remember which, uh, refers to that. So this demon, uh, through, the, through this young woman, uh, recognizes the message of Paul and recognizes that it is of Jesus, the, the most high God who had created them. And she knows that it is the way of salvation that they're proclaiming. Um, and she keeps yelling it. And this she kept doing for many days, we're told, in 18. And Paul, having become greatly annoyed, the ESV could have picked a lot of words rather than annoyed. Annoyed sounds like it was just bothered by it. You know, a fly buzzing around my face annoys me. He was distressed by this, uh, like Jesus was by demon possession. And so he said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. One of the evidences I would uh, posit that this demon uh, was not good at fortune-telling was he, this demon didn't seem to know this was going to happen to him. If he would have known the future, uh, should have stayed away from Paul uh, and Silas rather than being there in a place where she, he could be cast out or she could be cast out. We're not, not going to... Uh, don't know which it is. Anyhow, they came out, and it came out at that very hour. There you go, not he or she. It came out at that very hour. Now we're told what happens. The owners have lost um, this resource, this gain of income, and so they, arrest, they grab uh, Paul and Silas and take them to the magistrates. The polyarchs is the exact word. Uh, it's a, that's only important because Luke is accurate about this uh, in describing um, roles and positions changed names 
over, uh, over a period of time. And he uses the exact phrase, the exact word that would have, has been found from that very time. It's a slight point, but it just speaks also to the historicity and the accuracy of um, St. Luke as he, as he writes this. Um, they took him before the rulers, they brought him to the magistrates, and then they said, and this kind of supports that earlier, these guys are Jews. Now, anti-Semitism is um, nothing new. Uh, from the very beginning, there's been those who have hated the Jews or persecuted the Jews. And that's their, their first accusation. They're Jews, okay? And they've probably been kicked out. What are they doing here? And they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. And in, in a degree, that's true because it is now against Roman law to introduce new gods. And there doesn't say that Paul said anything about that. Um, but they might have certainly heard of the other teaching or there's stuff that Luke doesn't record, uh, the other conversations, uh, but gets right to the point. They know they're introducing a new God. So this crowd joins in a, attacking them, and the magistrates join in. They tore the clothes off of Paul and Silas and beat them with many blows. And I would have repeated this often. It is so understated. They were arrested, they were attacked, weren't arrested yet, they were attacked and then stripped and beaten. And that's all we hear. It's almost a ho-hum. It's almost, and I, I believe the reason for this and that why this is not a big deal, made a huge thing, because it's not going to be exceptional uh, for Paul uh, and for Christians. If they did it to me, Jesus said, they're going to do it to you, speaking about us. And so persecution for the sake of proclaiming Christ and speaking the truth and reality of the kingdom of God here on earth in Christ uh, is going to bring uh, troubles, persecution even, um, beatings. That's what Jesus had said was going to happen. And so they just say we're on the right road. If this is happening, we must be doing the right thing, uh, which is sort of counterintuitive for us. We think if we're doing the right thing and going along, then we, things ought to sail along and, and it ought to be a, a yellow brick road of some sort. It's, it's just the opposite. So it's, they beat him with many blows and threw him into prison, put him there in a torture to be brought out, I guess, the, the next day uh, to continue the trial or even start the trial. That's going to be important here in a minute because Paul is willing, and Silas, certainly willing to take the persecution and the beatings, but he will demand his rights as a Roman citizen and just a, the next day when that happens. Well, the next story is fairly familiar to us, I think, for many, about the uh, Philippian jailer and what happens. Well, they're in prison uh, at night, and what are they doing? Uh, they're not complaining, they're not commiserating, they're not whining. About midnight, Paul and Silas, they were still up, praying and singing hymns to God. Uh, later on, Paul would say that he considered it a privilege, that he was privileged to suffer for Christ. Uh, saw that as a privilege. And here they are, they're singing hymns to God. Uh, may have been the Psalms. Uh, people think, I think it's 81 to 91, uh, may have been some of the psalms they were singing, uh, trusting God and asking for deliverance and help, uh, and certainly they're going to get both in just a moment. And, but notice, the prisoners 
are listening to this, whenever they get a chance, in whatever situation, Paul is proclaiming the Almighty God, the living God, the God that Israel worshipped, who has now revealed himself in his Son, Christ Jesus, uh, as the Savior and the Lord of the world. And while they're doing that, suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. In the original language, it doesn't sound like a, uh, that this, the earthquake caused those. Uh, it was there to, to announce it. It may have made the doors fly open. We don't know. I don't know if it made the bonds come off um, or whether it was a sign of what was going on to lead to the next thing. Uh, doesn't make any difference. Because here's what's really important. First of all, everybody's bonds were unfastened, all the prisoners. And the unusual thing is we're going to hear in just a minute. And when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. It would be logical. He doesn't seem to have gone in. He Supposing this... Okay. Uh, we're going to have to pause a moment while I hang up my phone. We don't have to pause. Sorry. Took just a moment. I thought I had turned it off, but I didn't. Um, he didn't. He didn't go in. Okay. But Paul realizes what he's going to do, and he, so he yells out to him with a loud voice in 28, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And that was the surprise. Why hadn't they escaped? I think it's the influence of Paul, but we don't know that. Verse 29, and then the jailer called for lights and rushed in, trembling with fear, because he recognizes that this is from, this phenomenon is, has to do and associated with Paul and Silas, he falls down before them, and then he brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Um, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He had just been saved. Uh, his life had been saved. If the prisoners had escaped, uh, the penalty on his part was um, to sacrifice, I mean, to commit suicide in order to protect his family. His family then would could be spared, keep their property. Uh, so he was ready to do that. So he's been saved one way, but in this action, uh, this word, he's asking for something more. In fact, he's asking for the very same thing that the slave girl had been proclaiming, that these men were proclaiming the way of salvation from the living God. And that is what he asks for, and that's what he gets. Verse 20, 31, And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. There it is. Believe Christ salvation. Belief is, not, is more than just knowing it up here, getting knowledge. It is receiving it, and believing it, and trusting it, which is exactly what you would do if you were saved. Uh, and that's what salvation is. Salvation is to really be rescued. Uh, and it comes into your heart. I've, I've said before that if um, there's a, a cure for cancer, I mean, I would be delighted about that. I'd be joyful. But if I had cancer, it would be at a different level. And that different level is what faith is. It is the absolute conviction and confidence that we've been rescued from condemnation, from death, from everything else, and been put into a new life with God in relationship with the living God. Now, not just to get to heaven in the great by and by, but right here and now. And that is our privilege to live with the presence of God, with his grace, his mercy, his strength, his power, 
uh, his presence and his peace and all that else comes with them, okay? But it comes down to that. And it's not just for you, it's for your household. Uh, everyone can receive it. And we're not going to press here, does household mean, uh, are the babies there, this, this is not the place to necessarily argue or, or make a point about infant baptism, except to say uh, households often included them, and, and we'll see what happens in just a minute. Verse 32, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. So it wasn't just believe in Jesus and that's it. And the guy goes, okay, I believe in Jesus, whatever that means. They talked to them about the word of the Lord. And that comes out of the Old Testament. They, there was no New Testament. So they shared the word from the Old Testament and the word that they had been given by God through the Holy Spirit. Okay. And they did it to him. And then he took them that same hour that night. Doesn't mean first or last. It probably cleaned them up first. I might be my guess. Washed their wounds. And then he was baptized at once to confirm, in this case, to confirm that faith and trust. And he brought them, and he and all of his family. Um, that may be a little different. Uh, household and family, sometimes they're used interchangeably. Um, and sometimes household also would include servants, but not necessarily the immediate family. I don't know why they use, why Luke used different words here. But he rejoiced. He brought them up to his house and must have been good Lutherans because when we gather together, we have food. Uh, and Isaiah 55 talks about that. Uh, the, those of you who are hungry, come and receive food and drink without payment. It's a free gift to you. And what he had received from Paul and Silas, he returns in a, a lesser way, but important, giving them food. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. The salvation of his life immediately is going to, in a very, is, is important uh, in the long run because it opened the way for his life eternal. Uh, salvation, and they rejoiced, which is what you do if you've been rescued, uh, been saved, you rejoice. <laughs> You're filled with the, the joy of faith, uh, the joy of being in this relationship with God. And again, I would remind us, we have been rescued, saved, forgiven, not just so we go to heaven, we're going to get to heaven, and that is the ultimate. That is the next ultimate goal until the resurrection. Uh, but in between, we are living in the presence of God with all of his power, with all of his presence, all the things we've, we've talked about, and the commission to serve him, to love our brothers and our sisters in the faith, to speak the word, encourage one another, and then together as a congregation and as individual Christians to seek all the ways we can to invite others uh, into this, um, what did they call it? Uh, practices, advocate customs that are new. And declaring Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of the whole world uh, is certainly new again to our culture. We've forgotten it, um, and we have that opportunity to speak it. Maybe we can finish this uh, chapter up because they're not going to stay long in Philippi after this. But when it was day, verse 55, the magistrates sent the police saying, let these men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in, in peace. So the jailer is, I'm sure, glad about this. Um, he gets to let Paul go. I don't know what word had reached the magistrates or if it was because of that word that the magistrates have decided to do this. But here's where Paul um, claims his civil rights as a Roman citizen. But Paul said to them, 
They have beaten us publicly uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do now they want to throw this, throw us out secretly. Um, the penalty for what they did to Paul and Silas uh, was very drastic, um, including the same thing that this jailer thought he would have to do to take their own lives. Roman citizens were protected by Roman law, and this was unlawful to treat a Roman citizen. Being beaten, uh, flogged publicly, was one of the things that was not allowed, except under extreme, extreme circumstances. So Paul says, no, no, uh, we're going to teach him a lesson here. Uh, let them come in and take us out. So people know publicly that we were innocent, that this was unfair. That is going to help, not Paul and Silas so much, uh, but the, the the nascent church, the beginning church that is uh, forming now in Philippi, and we're going to hear that in just a minute, that there's going to be perhaps a little more respect in hearing the word they have to say. Verse 28, and then the police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens, so they came and apologized to them, and then they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So Paul and Silas are willing to do that, but they're not going to be forced out. And so we hear this in 40. And so claiming our civil rights as a church and as Christians, we have every right to do that. I don't know that we can expect uh, special treatment of any sort, uh, but our rights are our rights, uh, and taking that and using that for the sake of the gospel, uh, not so much because they're my rights, but so that, that nothing is going to hinder the, the gospel. And we want to remove every obstacle we possibly can to people actually opening their ears and their hearts and their minds to hear the good news of Christ. And one of those ways is not to demand our rights. That's what humility really is. But here you see a case where he takes, he demands his civil rights. So they went out of the prison and they visited Lydia. They went back, gathered up their stuff, um, commended the church. When they had seen the brothers, now notice what's changed because it was Lydia and women and now men have joined. So we don't know exactly how long, there have been many days, we were told earlier, that the girl had said that. We don't know how long uh, Paul was at Philippi. Uh, Luke doesn't care about that very much. His uh, dates and times don't matter a lot to him. Uh, the facts are, matter. So he wants us to know that they didn't scurry out with their uh, tails between their legs. The disciples and the apostles, I mean, the apostles never did that. Uh, they really went on from victory unto victory because when they were forced or had to move to the next place, they weren't running scared. They were going on to the next ministry. This ministry here had begun. There are now brothers there, the word for Christians, um, joined together. And so the church is formed. And this is going to always be uh, one of Paul's favorite churches. This is the church that um, sends him aid, uh, even though he says, I don't need it or, or even don't want it, but I receive it with thanksgiving. And he shows in his letter to the Philippians later, great affection. And he also um, wants to make sure that church is established by leaving some of his people uh, with them. And, and we'll pick that up uh, next week as we, as we move into chapter 17. So, uh, receive the benediction of our Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and forever. Amen. God bless you, and have a great week, and be safe.